Let's bow our heads for prayer. I want you to present yourself to the Lord. Father, we thank you for this night. We praise you because of the way you have continued with us and how the work has been going on. Lord, I'm asking that tonight you will speak to every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. We bless your name because of the great things you are doing in the different zones, in all the zonal meetings, how people are reporting and testifying that they are getting sanctified, that they are being baptized in the Holy Spirit. Lord, we just pray that the great work you are doing in the various zones will continue and take deep roots in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we're looking up to you that what you have done in this city as well as in this nation through this church that you have raised up, the Deeper Life Bible Church, that it will continue to spread and more people will come in to enjoy the goodness of the Lord in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we're asking that you'll bless us this night even together. In Jesus' name I pray. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And in verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. And from verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? It's nice and it is necessary once in a while that a real child of God will examine himself because he'll be examined and tested on the last day. And so it is good that as we go on in the work, as we live in this life, to examine ourselves frequently. As we're told in this passage that we should examine ourselves whether we're still in the faith and we should prove our own selves. We should check up our lives with the Bible, our character, our heart attitude, and the dispositions that we have. Then it says, do you not know yourselves how that Jesus Christ is in you except you be reprobates? The verse makes us to understand that it is possible to become reprobates, rejected before the Lord, become like counterfeit, that is no more having a genuine experience of the Lord. And the Bible says the only way we can do that is that we would examine ourselves. How do we examine ourselves? How will we be able to tell whether we are in the faith or not in the faith. The practice of some is to compare themselves with other people. And if they still feel they are better than other people, then they feel that they are okay spiritually. Because comparing themselves with another religious fellow, it seems as if they are better than that religious person. And even though that other religious person may be bad himself, and they happen to be better, they feel that that makes them all right before the Lord. But the scripture makes us to understand that if we compare ourselves with other people, we make a grievous mistake. And we do not discover who we are spiritually, where we stand spiritually, 
as long as our comparisons are with other people. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, would also praise themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. You will never discover the truth about yourself as long as you are comparing yourselves with other people. And you think you seem spiritual just because you are better than a particular religious fellow. But it says, if you, are going to, if you are going to judge yourself, if you are going to examine yourself, there are spiritual ways, standard ways of doing that, that will make you to know where you stand and how you are. And it, this is a case where you have to be very honest with yourself, where you have to be very honest with the truth. So then, how do you examine yourself? To see whether you are still in the faith or you are not in the faith. Because the Spirit of God has told us from Paul the Apostle, examine yourselves. And the erroneous ways that many people do that, we've said it's wrong. By comparing themselves with other religious people. How then do I do it? How do you do it? One is to close your eyes to what other people feel, what other people say, and how other people live. And go to the mirror and look at yourself and see how you stand. The mirror will tell you if you are crooked, if you are wicked, if you are not straightforward, if you are not standing straight and you are bent low, Circumstances have changed your posture, or changed your attitude, or changed your life. The mirror will tell you. In James chapter 1, from verse 23, For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, it's like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Here the Bible makes it very clear that if we're going to examine ourselves, whether we're clean or dirty, whether we're straight or crooked, whether we're innocent or guilty, that the, the thing to do is to go before the mirror, the word of God. And the mirror of the word of God will tell you who you are. What's your spiritual condition? Where do you stand today? How does the Lord see your life? That's how to examine ourselves. And if we're going to examine ourselves, we must begin to examine ourselves on the inside. How is your heart? Are you still soft in the heart? Repentant? when you have made a mistake, when you have done something wrong, is the heart soft and tender that will easily be touched by the conviction of the word of God? You will be able to check up yourself on repentance. And then, do you immediately turn, make a change, when the word of God has convicted you? When the word of God has pointed to you that you are wrong, how is your heart towards the brethren? Do you forgive? Do you live a life that is not bogged down by offenses with other people? Or do you carry those offenses in the heart? 
Are you soft-hearted when people have offended you and they plead with you saying that they are sorry? Do you readily forgive and forget? You must examine your heart by what the scripture says. That's the mirror. If you are hard in the heart, if it's difficult to please you, difficult to appeal to you when you have been offended, then you must know that you are no more straight, but you are crooked, that your heart is no more soft, but it is hard. It is no more a heart of flesh, it's a heart of stone. And therefore, you will go back to the Lord and say, Lord, I see that I'm crooked already. I'm not straight anymore. And I want you to wash me again in the blood of Jesus Christ. How's your heart when it comes to being clean and holy? Your relationship with women if you're a man. Your relationship with men if you are a woman. Would you say you are clean? Is your heart clean? Or is your heart full of uncleanness and evil and lust? Jesus did say, if you look on a woman to lust after her, you have committed adultery already in your own heart. And how are you with even small girls that are not of age? Do you destroy yourself with thoughts of evil? with lost, inordinate affection within your own heart. And you women must also understand what Jesus said applies to everyone. If you to look on a man to lost after him, you as a woman, you have committed adultery already in your own heart. We are to judge ourselves by the word of God. Last week you listened to the cassette on the circumcision of heart. Is your heart humble or proud? Are you stubborn or easy to be directed and easy to be controlled? Are you stiff-necked, rebellious, or you are gentle and you come under authority? We must look at our hearts according to the mirror of the word of God. Jesus Christ spoke to the church or the churches in Asia in Revelation chapter 2. From verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. We must check up on what the word of God says about love. Love towards God. Do I still love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength? Or is there something that competes between me and God, between God and I? Something that competes or rivals with the love of God in my heart? Is it business? Is it things of the world? Christ himself said that he has somewhat against these people, that thou hast left thy first love. And you must begin to check yourself and begin to find out from the word of God, what the word of God says on the love of God, and whether that's in your heart or not. Examine your own selves. Whether you are in Christ, except you are reprobate. That means if that love of God is no more there, no more active within you, then you are reprobate. You have a name that you live, but you are dead. You have an identity card that carries the fact that you are a member of the visible church, but you are not a member of the invisible church. That means you are backsliding. No more in Christ. Because Christ does not live on the inside of you anymore. And your life is the opposite of love towards God. You cannot consecrate to God anymore. 
You cannot be devoted to God anymore. And Jesus said, these people had left their first love. Then your love for the word of God. You heard last week that when we first believed, the word of God was precious to us, as precious to us, or even more precious to us, than letters written by a loved person. When you are preparing for marriage, you love those letters, you love those words. And that's the way a child of God will love the word of God, even more so, much more than that. And if you find that there is no more love in your heart towards the word of God, that now all that is important to you is just activities that sometimes we can be here preaching the word of God and others can be seated like this. You always stand up and you go outside and you just walk about because for you now you have become a worker and since you are a worker what's the need of sitting down to hear the word of God the thirst the hunger to hear more of the word of God is no more there then that means that you've left your first love and Jesus said there's only one thing to do if you examine yourself and you see that you have left the word of God then you must repent and do the first works all over again then your love to the church, you heard about it last Saturday. That if you love God, you will love the word of God and you will love God's people. But if the love for God's people is no more there in your heart, you should examine yourself. That means that if you do not have the love of the people of God in your heart, then the love of God is not there. You have left your first love. And the thing to do is to go back and repent and say lord i've examined myself i have come before the mirror of the word of god and see that i am crooked i'm no more straight and my life is no more in line with the word of god the mirror of the word of god has revealed that there's something that is desperately wrong in my life and then we have seen that we should also love God's creatures. There should be that compassion, that mercy within us towards the people of the world, wanting to win them to the Lord. And in the zones, how do you love the people of God, the children of God? You must examine yourself to see whether you stand in the faith or you are not standing in the faith. Examine yourself. Jesus said, I have this against you. You have left your first love. Then it says, remember therefore, from whence thou art fallen. There are literatures, so-called Christian literature, that will make you to feel that once you are saved, you'll be forever saved. You can never lose your experience with God. That you are saved, you are saved. No matter what you do, everything is okay. You never fall. But Jesus Christ himself said, Remember, from whence thou art fallen, and repent. And do the first works. That means go back to God like you did originally so that there will be a change again, a transformation again. Now, here we do not believe eternal security. We do not have any sympathy with the doctrine that says once a child of God uh, has experienced the joy of the Lord, once a person has come into the fold, once he has been born again, Whatever he does after that is forever saved. We're not in sympathy with that erroneous doctrine. A lot of people preach that, but we don't. We believe from what Jesus said that people can fall from grace. People can depart from where they were standing before. And that's the very reason why we examine ourselves. If it is not possible to fall, 
if forever you are saved, once you are born again, then why examine yourself? And why will Jesus say, remember whence, from whence you are falling, and do the first works, and repent? Then Jesus said, if you don't, he says, or else I will come unto you quickly, and I will remove the candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. That means he will remove the light. The little assurance you have got that you belong to God, he will remove it. The grace of God that has been keeping you before and helping you before, now that you have repudiated everything, you have rejected everything, thrown everything away, sheepishly and foolishly yourself, then he says he will leave, he will depart. He will take the candlestick out of its place. And when the light in you has been removed, how great the darkness will be. Examine yourself and see whether you stand in the faith. That same chapter, verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, that hold who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Christ is against immorality, uncleanness. It's against pornography. It's against adultery, fornication, and it's against anything that is similar to any of those things. And yet, there are people that deceive themselves. And they take liberty with women. Or with bad pictures. Or with bad literature. And they say, well, they are only studying to improve on their English. And the things they're reading are so degrading, so corrupt, so polluting. You cannot have all those things in your heart and remain a Christian. Remain a child of God. That's one of the reasons why this church has counseled and taught believers that we should be very careful what we see what we allow to come into our minds on the street, over the television, from newspapers, and from books that are written by corrupt men of the world that try to divert the attention of people into things immoral. Because those things will destroy your Christian life. And if you're a real Christian, you cannot continue to have anything to do with pornography books, anything to do with uh, cinema houses that will pollute you and corrupt you and destroy your Christian life. But Jesus said in this particular church that we have read about now, there were people that were teaching other believers to take things sacrificed to idols and also that they could commit fornication. And of course you know that the Bible is against polygamy. And polygamy starts in small, small ways. Before you are married, if you say you are seeing the will of God to two different sisters, already you are starting on the line of polygamy. And you are keeping friendship and a type of mini engagement or courtship with two sisters and you're unfaithful already you're in the line of polygamy maybe you are gambling you are not willing to pray to know what is the will of god and because of that you're going on with this one and going on with another one or you have seen the marriage committee 
and the marriage committee has already approved that you go and see a particular sister. You have seen that sister. She says she has prayed, and you are going along with her. And then there is another sister in the fellowship. You are as close to her as you are close to the person you are engaged to. You discuss with her intimately as much as you do with the person you say you are engaged to. That's polygamy. That's how it starts. You might cover it up and say it is because I am an area leader. And because I'm an area leader, I have to counsel, I have to see people, I have to help people. But you know in your heart that you are carrying on a love affair secretly, maybe even unknowingly, to that other lady that you are discussing with. And you lady, you know somebody is engaged, and you'll discuss intimately with that person. And you say, well, it's all Christian love. That's how to begin the life of a second wife. Because you are diverting the attention of that man from the person he is engaged to. And you are asking money from him. You don't want to die of hunger. You will rather be like Esau and say, what will the birthright do me? Because I am hungry. Therefore, this engaged man should still take care of me because there is no other person to take care of me. That's how to start the life of polygamy. That's the way it begins. All the people you have seen that get into polygamy, a good percentage of them started the life and the line of polygamy before they married the very first wife. Before. They were going on as sinners, wanting to marry a particular woman. And, but all along, they didn't cut off from all other women. So after they married that first person, then this other person was still arresting their attention, still inviting them. And eventually, they'll see more beauty in her than the one at home. That's how the second wife comes in. And so if you're engaged, and you say, well, because I'm an area leader, or because I'm a leader in the choir, and that is why I need to see into the lives of all these uh, women, and you discuss with them, intimately with them, and after the choir, you have to accompany them on their, in the way to their houses. That's how to start polygamy. Oh, you might say this person is um, as married, but my brother, she is not with her husband. Either because uh, she is taking her stand as a Christian, expecting the husband still to come back, and now you are feeling the position of a husband. You are discussing about the children. You are discussing about food. You are discussing about her salary. You are discussing about her welfare. That's marriage. There's no other thing. And also, she knows about your life. I was in your house two days ago. You were not around. Where did you go? You have to tell her everything about your life, what plans you are making, what you are doing, why you are not around. She also, what's happening to her, all those details, that's marriage. The only thing that remains is to go to bed. So that means that already, if you are like that in the choir, you are on the way to polygamy. If you're like that as a zonal leader or as an area leader, is on the way already to polygamy. And that's how fornication begins. That's how adultery also begins. Examine yourselves. Whether you stand in the faith, except ye be reprobates. Now, you women, that have maybe you made restitution, or not that you made restitution, your husband pushed you away. And you say you are still praying. Now, understand, you could feel lonely. But when you feel lonely, what do you do? If you go to seek out a man, not a woman like yourself, if you go to seek out a man, and you sit down talking for one hour, for two hours, um, so as to embodying your heart to that man. You can't do it to a woman like yourself, but just to a man all the time. A man all the time. That's mini marriage. You're trying to seek comfort 
from that man like you will seek from your absent husband. If you were really sincere, if you were standing, you will go to a woman like yourself, not to a man. If you are being drawn away as a woman, not with your husband at present, because of a marriage problem. If you are not close to women like yourself, and you're always seeking out men, only men, only men, to rely on, to seek comfort from, you are in another marriage already. And every time you are not in the presence of that particular man, maybe zonal leader, maybe a full-time worker with us in the church here, or maybe just an area leader, or maybe just uh, a house fellowship leader, or maybe just an ordinary member of the church. Anytime you don't see that man, you feel so lonely. You feel as if God is not there anymore. That's marriage. That means you are living in adultery already. And whenever you see that man, there's something that comes up in your heart, an excitement. What's that? That's love affairs. That's no more zonal leader and member. That's no more area leader and Christian sister. That is on the road to marriage. That's polygamy. And there are a lot of people that don't understand these things. Their lives are destroyed. They cannot pray. They are keeping on a love affairs with other people that are not their wives, that are not their husbands. And they're teaching one another, saying that it is not wrong. We must be very, very watchful, very, very careful. Examine yourself from the mirror of the word of God. Now you see, without the mirror of the word of God, all that I'm telling you now, you'll never discover. You'll think you're all right. While you have lost in the heart. While you have another semi-marriage going on at the corner. You will think there's nothing wrong with it. Then those of you who are married, your wives are with you. And there's another sister in the fellowship. Her dressing, you prefer to that of your wife. And every time you are telling your wife, look at sister so-and-so, how she dresses. Unfortunately for you, that sister so-and-so is an unmarried person. And your wife wonders, why is it it's only sister so-and-so you see in the church? To compare me with. That's how fornication begins. And if that sister so-and-so comes to visit you and comes to visit your family, now, if you are a wife and a sister so-and-so like that, coming to visit, and your husband is always pointing to her, saying, don't you see her? She knows how to talk. Her English is good. Her dressing is good. If you don't report to the zonal leader in time, you are breaking your family. That sister so-and-so will get your husband from you. And say, well, uh, I don't know why I love you like this. There are other men that are not married in the church, but I don't, uh, I don't have love to them like this. And the man is already in a trap because already he has preferred that sister so-and-so to the wife. And when the woman is now saying, when the lady is now saying, I don't know why I love you like this, they are going to backslide. They're going to go to the registry and going to get married. They're going to leave the church and say, well, we know that uh, the church will not like this. But there's another church downtown that doesn't mind for, you know, people to remarry another person while the other wife is still around. And woman, if you're married, and I saw always a woman, they're always coming for, a, a woman that is coming for counseling every day. There's something wrong with that woman. She can't pray on her own. She can't read Bible on her own. She doesn't have the comfort of the Holy Spirit on her own. Every night, and she always comes in the night. She'll feel so lonely if she has not seen that brother for today. And she doesn't know. And maybe you are like that. You say you're a sister. That you'll feel restless at home. You cannot sit back at home and read Bible. Something will make you to rise up and go to that brother. Every night. 
And if you're a married woman, you see a sister coming like that every day, every day to your husband. And they will discuss and discuss and discuss. And when the wife uh, comes to maybe ask the man to come and eat or wants to ask a question, the man seems to be enjoying the conversation, what they call counseling, that he's not interested in any other person in the world. Not interested in the wife, not interested in the children, not interested in the home. If you don't report it to the zonal leader in time, if your family breaks, it is you that broke your family. Because you saw that evil thing coming into your family and you didn't talk. And your husband quieted you and said, there is no danger, it's only counseling. And it's when the woman becomes pregnant, you know it is not just counseling. It's beyond counseling. And if your own wife, you are married, and you happen to be an area leader or house fellowship leader yourself, but your wife will always go to brother so-and-so, I'm going for counseling. But I'm your husband, I am here. Can I not counsel you? No, it's brother so-and-so's counseling. He's an area leader, I am an area leader. What is he telling you that I cannot tell you? She is not just going for counseling. She is also going for Naira. Because the area leader would always give her Naira. Every time. And if your wife is going like that, always leaving the house, and you say, well, I leave them to God. Well, you leave them to God. If your home is broken, remember, it's you that left them to God. They don't listen to God. How can you leave a man or a woman that doesn't listen to God? How can you leave him to God? He doesn't listen and she doesn't listen. You must report that to the zonal leader or to the coordinator. If you're an IFL, the coordinator for IFL is there. The thing goes beyond um, the zonal leader. And if you are the normal house fellowship, adult house fellowship, the coordinator is there. If that problem goes beyond your zonal leader before your home breaks, and um, if the thing is going beyond them, then they will tell you to see the pastor so that your home is not broken while we're still here. Let's avoid fornication. And if you know you have that tendency, then you must be very careful. Go back to God and say, Lord, an evil thing has come back into my life, into my heart. Deliver me. And God will deliver in Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter 3 of Revelation. Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, This thing saith he, that hath the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. That's why we examine ourselves. We see, are we still alive in Christ? Are we still alive in the word of God? What does the mirror of the word of God say about how we live and about our lives? Is it saying that we're dirty? We're polluted? We're going astray? What does the mirror say about our inner man, about our hearts, about our good standing in the Lord and in spiritual things? Let a man examine himself. Examine yourselves to see whether you stand in the faith. Or don't you know that Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates? Number one, how do we examine ourselves? I told you, by looking at the mirror of the word of God. Number two, how do we examine ourselves? By standing side by side with Jesus Christ. Measuring our lives by the life of Christ. The Bible has already told us, if we measure ourselves one with the other, it says that we are not doing right. So I cannot measure myself with brother so-and-so. 
you cannot measure yourself by another religious fellow. The very first thing for you to do is to look into the mirror of the word of God. And it will tell you whether you are clean or dirty, upright or crooked. But number two, I will stand beside the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the perfect one. We're told in Psalm 37 and verse 37 Mark the perfect man and behold the upright for the end of that man is peace. And the most perfect one that ever lived is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mark that perfect one. Stay side by side with him. Compare your life with his. Then you will see what things are still lacking in your own life. In First John chapter 2, Verse 6. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. If we say we abide in Christ, we ought to walk even as Christ walked. And when you stand side by side with the Lord Jesus Christ, you must ask yourself, how obedient to the Father am I? Compare the obedience of Jesus Christ. How submissive to the total will of God I am. Consider the submission of Jesus Christ to the will of the Father. How am I consumed with the zeal of his house? Consider the way that Jesus was consumed by the zeal of the Lord. How compassionate I am on the people that have gone astray, on the lost. How do I seek them? Jesus was compassionate when he saw the multitude that they fainted, he had compassion on them. How honest I am, am I? Because the Bible says that he was sinless and honest and innocent. How innocent am I? Stand beside the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how to examine yourself. His wisdom, his relationship with other people, the holiness of his life, the justice within him manifested in his life. Stand side by side with the Lord Jesus Christ and see where you have gone wrong. Expresses surprise at her own dress because of the comparison with the perfect whiteness of the other dress. What a parable for us. As you see the white robe on the Lord Jesus Christ, his character, his life, his characteristics, the attributes in him, and then you look at him very, very closely. It makes you to see that you are not as clean, as white as you ought to be. Stand side by side with the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, look at the mirror of the word of God. The scriptures. Number two, look at the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And make a comparison. And see how far you still need to go. How more humble you still need to become. How submissive you still need to become more and more. And look at him picking up that bowl of water, washing the disciples' feet. And see how arrogant you are. How proud you are. Even after you say you are sanctified. Even after you say you are baptized in the Holy Spirit. Compare yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will show you how far you still need to go. Number three. Open up to the Spirit of God. He is the one that will convict. Many times, 
before the spirit comes to convict, we think we're all right. We think everything is okay. But as we open up to the spirit of God, he is the one that comes to convict of sin. And some things that you might have been indulging in that you might have felt, maybe there's nothing wrong in this. A little gossip. Even after hearing that message, our significant little member, still the gossip has continued. But it is when you open up to the Spirit of God that the Spirit of God will show you you've heard that from the Word of God. Backbiting is wrong. Gossiping is wrong. Tail bearing is wrong. And going about with rumors, that is wrong. Killing or destroying the zona leader or the area leader or other people through your tongue, that is wrong. Beating down your wife with the tongue or nagging your husband with your tongue, that is wrong. When you open up to the Spirit of God, it is the Spirit of God that will convict you and say, that's exactly what I gave the preacher to preach on the other Sunday. Let there be a change. Look into the mirror of the word of God, the scripture. Look at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Compare your life with his, our savior. Open up to the spirit of God. He is the one that will convict of sin. Now, what is sin? Basically, we know the sins that were read about in Romans chapter 1, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. But for us who are workers and believers, we need to understand that the root word for sin means missing the mark. The root word for sin, the Greek word, the interpretation of that Greek word is missing the mark. And whenever you see that, you look at the mirror of the word of God. And the mirror says, you are missing the mark. The mark of purity. If you are just looking at fornication, ordinarily, you might say, well, I am not committing sin. But when you look at it as missing the mark, what's the mark? What's the perfect thing? How should my heart be? towards all women apart from my wife that's the mark but is my heart like that if the heart is not like that you have missed the mark that's what the bible calls sin what's my relationship with other men as a woman now i've been writing to my husband let's come together let's come together if my husband knows that there is in my heart an affinity, an intimate fellowship with another man in the church, will he take me serious that I want us to come together? If he knows that I'm seeking comfort and solace and um, I'm seeking fellowship and care from some two, three men in the church, even my unbelieving husband, how would he feel? Well, if that is so, you are missing the mark. That's what the Bible calls sin. How honest are you? The money that is contributed in the zone. Are you straightforward? 100% honest. Or if God were to deal with us as he dealt with Ananas and Sapphira even today, would many of us be dead here tonight without a chance to return what was spent from church money, from zonal money? That's missing the mark. That's a sin. Or if um, you're cheating other people and it's not something you can say, this is the name for what you have done, but you have missed the mark. It's not straight. As straight as a ruler. There's something crooked there. Something being covered. That's missing the mark. And it is when you open up to the Holy Spirit 
that the Holy Spirit will show you you are missing the mark. There's not that perfect honesty. And then the way you use your tongue and your attitude to other brothers and sisters, the Lord will show you. Your love to the people of God. If you are bearing grudge, you are missing the mark. Examine yourself and see whether you are in the faith or not in the faith. Don't you know yourselves? Except ye be reprobates. So examine yourself. God gives us chance to examine ourselves. If we don't do it, then he comes to examine us. Every citizen in the country, talking now in the normal, natural sense, can examine himself and see that there is no smuggled good, there is no forbidden thing in his house. If he doesn't, and he waits until the, until the policeman comes to examine him, then when that policeman examines him and he finds him wrong, judgment will come. If you examine yourself, you set everything right, then God will pardon, God will forgive, God will set you right. But if you don't, then God himself comes to examine you. Then judgment comes. Who will deliver you from the hand of God? Eli called his children, like I've called you tonight. I said, children, why do I hear all this about you? I hear that you mess up with the women that come to give their offerings at the gate. This is offensive to God. Children don't do like that. Because if God comes to judge you, he comes to examine you. Who will deliver you from God? Who will plead with you before God? So children, make right your ways. And Eli did not go beyond that. He could have gone beyond that because they were not up to six, seven thousands like you. There were only two. So he could have sat with them. When you have only two workers, you can easily examine them. If you are telling them to look at the mirror and they don't, you are looking at them to compare themselves with the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, they don't. You tell them to open up to the Spirit of God so they can be examined and so that they can set everything right. They don't. If they only two, you get in there yourself and examine them. And if they are not all right spiritually, then remove them from the work and let them go and settle. If you see that they are not even showing they are born again, tell them they are lost. They are not born again. Tell them directly. If they are only two, that is easy. But... How can I begin to examine you one by one here tonight? That's difficult. How can I go, come before you one by one and say, look at your sister. You're having another man and you are committing sin in your heart already. Brother, you have concubines. Wife at home, concubine in the church. Now, if we're not many, I can do that. I can come to you one by one, but we're so many. So God cannot judge me on your behalf like he did for Eli. Because he knows that you are too many. And I've told you how you can examine yourself. Now, if you don't, Christ himself says he will come. And he will judge when he judges, anything can happen. Those who don't understand, they will say, ah, sister so-and-so, how can that happen to her? God knows. Brother so-and-so, how can that happen to him? God knows. You may not know. We may not know. But God is still a God of judgment even today. But how many are going to wait and say, I don't care. Let him come and judge me. It will be terrible. 
and judgment will come. The Bible says judgment will start in the house of God. If we're telling people outside there to make restitution of stolen money, and there are people inside here stealing church money from the zone, if God will judge the people outside there who are stealing ordinary money, what will God do to those who are stealing church money? Among those who are counting the money, you are counting and then you say, it's where we work, we must eat. And you put 20 naira, 25 naira. Because God knows, God understands that I don't have food at home. And they have brought me to count offering on Sunday. And you put 25 naira inside. God understands. When the judgment begins to fall, the people who didn't know that you stole 25 naira from counting in the church will be saying, God, why is this? God, why is this? They'll begin to fast and pray for you. And God will say, like he told Jeremiah, don't pray for them. I am dealing with them. Women, if God says, your talking is too much, your talking is too much, you talk about everybody, about president in the country, about pastor in the church, about uh, tax in the town, about tithe in the church. Everything, you are the only one that knows how to talk. Why don't you keep quiet? When the judgment comes, you are not going to enjoy it. Examine yourself. It is still good now as we are all seated here. Don't let us wait for the judgment of God. It will be a terrible thing. Let's clean up our lives. Let's go to the fountain of the blood of Jesus that cleanses and washes whiter than snow. And God can cleanse us. Can he not cleanse us? Why wouldn't he cleanse us? The people that are just coming to the Lord, he's forgiving them. He is saving them. He's cleansing them. How about those of us who are sitting right at the center of the whole thing? The center of the revival. If we go to God and we say, Lord, we have gone before the mirror of the word of God. We have seen also, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, comparing our lives with His. We have opened ourselves to the Spirit of God and we see that something is wrong. Something is wrong. The Lord will forgive us if we repent. The Lord will have mercy and He will bring us back to the real foundation where we are. But don't let the repentance be too late. Seek the Lord while He may be found. Call you upon him while he's near. Because if we don't call upon him in time, it may come to a time that we'll call upon him and he'll say, I am sorry, I have no time anymore. The door of grace is closed. The door of mercy is locked up. It's unfortunate for those people. I pray that none of us will wait too late in Jesus' name. Amen. And whatever we are, let us understand that God is no respecter of persons. Now, you must understand that God is the ancient of days. And all of us who are here, including myself, it's you that calls me pastor. That's all right. Or you call me man of God, that's all right. But before God, who am I? When was I born? I'm not up to an ant in the sight of God. And if I commit secret sin and I'm hiding it, and say I'm pastor, God doesn't know pastor. God will deal with that man. Look at Moses. God dealt with him. Look at David. God dealt with him. All those people in the Bible, all, all of us were small in the hands of God. 
it is when we when I stand before you, I say I'm pastor, I'm pastor. And it is true. I am your pastor. Am I God's pastor? Am I pastoring over God? Am I pastoring over angels? No. I'm only pastoring over you. And before God, if I don't allow the Spirit of God to search me and to examine me, and I say, I am pastor, God will throw away the person. How many pastors has he thrown away? Who will ask him question? Which angel will go and ask God question and say that you threw away that man? What's man that you visit him? Or the sons of men that you are mindful of him? What are we in the sight of God? God doesn't know pastor. If the pastor goes to commit sin, he doesn't know sooner leader, coordinator. It's when we are among ourselves like this, in the zone or in the church, that we say, I am zona leader. What does God care about that? I am coordinator. I am pastor. All that is important to God is that we are living right. If you are living right, God will honor you. If you are a small child like this, God will pick you up. He will exalt you. He will raise you high. He will raise you above all other people when you are living right. Even if you are not coordinator, even if you are not zona leader, even if you are not an area leader, just an ordinary member, but living right and loving God. God will exalt you. I will honor him. I will exalt him. Because he knows my name. And because he loves me. But if that man will say, I am pastor, and I will begin to commit adultery and fornication with people secretly, God will throw that man away. Or if you say that uh, I am uh, an area leader sister, uh, my sister, God doesn't know area leader. You find area leader in the Bible? No, it, that is deeper life uh, appellation, title. It's we that give you the name. It's not in the Bible. You see zona leader in the Bible? Ah, <laughs> our God is more than area leader. And that God is that God. Consuming fire. Be very careful. God can be very, very patient. One month, two months, three months. But one day, one day, a day of great indignation. Who can stand? Who can stand? Look at Belshazzar. King. It's in Babylon they knew him as king. What concerns God about Belshazzar being king? Then he began to drink and began to do all those things. And God said, that's enough. And then Antrati began to write on the wall. He weighed and found wanting. He didn't examine himself. He waited until God came down to write that thing. His knees began to knock together. He died that night and went to hell. Let's be very careful. God is too great to joke. Don't joke with God. When he loves you, when you are his child, and you go, you pray, you say, Daddy, give me this, and he gives you, that's the good part of it. That's when you are going right, you are okay with God. But once you go into secret sin, and you will not allow yourself to be brought back into repentance, that same God that blessed you before that God can be terrible so be careful God is too great to joke with don't joke with God anywhere you are fear God it's a consuming fire tonight examine yourself this is still the day of grace but I don't know when that day of grace will come to an end for anyone if you take God for granted remember he saw. He waited too long. That later when he even repented and cried with strong tears. God, God will not hear again. He had gone too far. Don't go too far. You have done enough. Come before the Lord and say, Lord, I am sorry. Have mercy on me. Rise up and let us pray.
เอเมนอาพัฒนาก็ไว้ทั้งการพิสูจน์ว่าด้วยวิญญาณที่คุณนั่งทุกข์ทุกวันนี้คุณได้สอบถามเราว่าเราเคยเห็นเราแต่เราอยากจะตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบเราด้วยการตรวจสอบ You are the great sculpture. You found us in sin, and you wanted to carve out Christ out of the life of every one of us. And you have given us the perfect Master, the perfect One. You ask us to examine, and our eyes are looking up unto Him. Father, you have discovered that there is a lot, a lot of things to do in our lives, and through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we have examined. We have told you things. You have to chisel out of our lives. That the likeness of the Lord might be seen in the life of every one of us, our God and our Father. Many a times we even think it in our hearts that why have you taught Almighty God to choose man even to come before you, to serve you, to worship you, and to even be like Jesus? It's a great privilege, and we know, dear Father, you have done it in the lives of many people. We find it in the Bible, people like Paul. Father, we look up unto you, and our hearts are crying unto you. We have only this world once, and we don't want to regret, dear Father, not enjoying the maximum that you have for us. That is why, Lord, we cry unto you, Father, that this great work you have started in the life of every one of us, finish it, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This is your church, and you cannot afford to see corruption. Already, you have seen a little here and there, and that's why you have spoken. Because if you have never seen something going wrong, you will never speak. And as we have spoken, these are the people who obey you, and we have examined ourselves. There is nothing we need to cover, because you have told us that he that covereth his sin will not prosper. You are the only one that can cover, and you cover with the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we have exposed everything unto you individually, and as a church. This wonderful church, which we will never regret being in, dear Father, out of many churches in the world today, you have made us to be member of this church because of holiness and purity. Your presence is here. You are moving here and there, and when you see iniquity, you point it out from time to time in order that you might remove it. We have examined. We have told you. We pray you will purge and purify every one of us, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. We cannot afford to miss your presence. It's just wonderful, even unto us, Lord Jesus. Your beauty, your purity, is more than anything, even unto us. And we covet it a lot. And we pray you will help us in this church that we continue to enjoy your presence. Not only when we gather together like this in our homes, in our places of work, in marketplaces, Father, these are our tongues, which you keep on pointing to from time to time. We call on you. We ask you by your godliness, by the fact that there is no other God who can do it for us. Father, we look up unto you. Come and do a great work of your grace in the life of every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. You have a long way to lead us, and we are still keeping for me. We are we are following you, and we pray, dear Father, the grace to continue to enjoy and to make our way right. Father, you give unto every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for tonight again. We bless you and we adore you as a church, Father. We consecrate ourselves again, even unto your service, unto this your great call you have given unto us. And we pray, dear Father, that as you purge and purify us, the work will continue to progress and prosper in the name of Jesus.